Arise, shine, your light has come. Glory to God in the Darkness covers the earth, but God's glory shines brightly. Lift up your eyes, look around. The light of God's love shines radiantly. Arise, shine, your light has come. Our hearts thrill with rejoice. Let us pray. O oh God of hope and light, your good news has been emblazoned across the skies. The great starry night of Jesus' birth, sung by angels, celebrated by shepherds, witnessed by animals, you have given to us a new chance, a reminder of your continual love for us. Be with us in this worship, we pray. Guide our thoughts, our lives, our spirits. Heal and restore us, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now will you stand as we sing We Three Kings. Promise. 
promise to reveal your glory through us and proclaim that we will shine like the sun when the world is plunged into shadows. Renew, Renew us in the power of your spirit when we refuse to follow the star and give the place before us. Hear these words of assurance. God fills us with the brightness of Christ and makes us shine like a star in the deepest night. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Now, as forgiven and reconciled people, we ask you to turn to your neighbor and share the peace of Christ. Good morning. Good morning. 
Christmas music, and I have vague memories of cooler weather. <laughs> so thank you. Um, what a joy. Uh, this is our third week in Matthew, and last week we completed that first chapter, and I want to remind you that in that very first chapter of Matthew, which we typically ignore except for parts of the Joseph story, um, there are some two very profound thoughts. First, he gives us a genealogy. Now, genealogies in first century among Jews normally only carry the men. And quite frankly, if we think about our own genealogies, there's some people we would like to live out, leave out. Is there not? I mean, maybe you don't have them in yours, but I have a few in mine. And, and we just like to put our best foot forward and say, you know, I'm the great, 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 great granddaughter of so-and-so, or I'm the great, 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 great granddaughter or grandson of, uh, of this historical figure. But Matthew doesn't do that with the genealogy. He puts it all in there, warts and all. And he includes women that aren't even Hebrew. Tamar, who uh, had to get her father-in-law's attention in a not-so-ethical um, way. And Rahab, who was a prostitute. And Ruth, who uh, uncovered Boaz's feet, if you know what that means. And Bathsheba, wife of Uriah. And then you have kings that are there. You have King David, but then you have Ahaz and Manasseh. All these people that uh, really contributed to the downfall of Israel. So what is Matthew doing in this genealogy? He's telling us that I don't care what you've done. I don't care who your family is. I don't care what your lineage is. You belong. You fit. God has not excluded anybody based on their past. This is good news, and it is good news for you. The second thing he does is that he tells us that Joseph is righteous. And then he tells us that Joseph is not only righteous, which normally would mean Joseph follows all the laws, that Joseph is righteous and he's not going to follow the law. Joseph is putting compassion above the law. So you have these two very bold statements. No matter what your failures or your disappointments, God knows what you've done to survive in your darkest days. God knows your hopes and dreams. God knows your heart. You're included in Jesus' family tree. And this unique idea that following the law isn't always righteousness. Uh, I told you on the first week, we we're going to look at two things, three things. One is how many times it says to fulfill scripture. One is how many times they use the word righteousness or righteous. And how many times you're going to get the word kingdom. We haven't gotten to the kingdom part yet, but let me remind you that uh, in the first chapter, you had one to fulfill scripture. And you had one righteous. But in chapter 2, you actually have four passages that to fulfill Scripture. Four. So, anyway, let me go ahead and read to you. You know the story from 
uh, the earlier part of chapter 2. So let me begin with verse 13. When the Magi had departed, an angel from the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod will soon search for the child in order to kill him. Joseph got up and during the night took the child and his mother to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod died. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I have called my son out of Egypt. When Herod knew the Magi had fooled him, he grew very angry. He sent soldiers to kill all the children in Bethlehem and in all the surrounding territory who were two years old and younger, according to the time he had learned from the Magi. This fulfilled the word spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and much grieving, Rachel weeping for her children, and she did not want to be comforted because they were no more. After King Herod died, an angel from the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said, and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. Those who were trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus ruled over Judea in place of his father Herod, Joseph was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he went to the area of Galilee. He settled in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Let us pray. May your scripture always be my delight, O Lord. May I not be deceived in them or deceived by them. Amen. How many times do you think you've heard the Christmas story? A hundred? A thousand? Two thousand? We've heard this story so many times. It's become so familiar to us that sometimes we miss a few things like geography. Geography is important to Matthew. Now Luke tells us that Mary and Joseph traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now why were they in Nazareth? Probably because that was Mary's hometown and she was pregnant and they were probably hoping that the child would come before they had to go register for the tax. They were probably staying nearby to be near her family, to give her comfort, but the deadline ran out and they had to go to Bethlehem. So they traveled from what we know they had planned to live in Bethlehem. So as they were traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem, they were actually planning just going home. In other words, that's where Joseph is from. And if you're looking for work, there is more work near Bethlehem with Jerusalem just being a few miles away and one of Herod's uh, more recent projects Herodium being just a couple of miles away. So after Jesus was born, they may have remained in Bethlehem at least a year, maybe even close to two, before the wise men showed up with their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, these gifts were not without a meaning. The gold is representative of royalty, and so they were acknowledging that they were paying homage to a king. The incense is a symbol for deity, and so normally you would burn incense, and it's an act of worship. But the myrrh has a different connotation. 
Myrrh is an anointing oil that's used for embalmment for death. Now these magi were warned that Herod, who had asked the magi to return to him and let him know where he, they found the child so he could go worshiping, magi were warned that this story was false. That Herod had something else in mind. He was just looking, hoping they would provide an easy access to the location. So they went home by a different way, and this made Herod furious. So he decides to do something else. In the meantime, Joseph is warned in another dream. Remember, we've got a Joseph in the Old Testament who keeps having dreams, and now we have a Joseph in the New Testament who is having dreams. And the dream, the angel tells him to take Mary and the baby and leave immediately for Egypt because Herod is going to come after the child's wife. And sure enough, Herod does. He's so angry that he looks at the timeline of how old the child might be or how, what's the oldest it might be. And Herod declares that all babies in Bethlehem and in the surrounding area must be slaughtered <coughs> if they are two and under. That is why Joseph and Mary went to Egypt. But a year or so later, Herod dies. And Joseph has another dream. And this dream tells him that Herod's died so he can go home. He can return back. But Joseph does his homework. So as he's returning back to Judea, he finds out that Herod's son, Archelaus, has taken over for his father's throne. And he realizes that perhaps his son is still threatened. So he decides to take Mary and the child back to Israel, back to the area of Galilee, back to Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was a blue-collar class town because near Nazareth, if you went 15 miles one way and you went 20 miles the other way, you would be in much more prosperous areas. It was four miles from Zephorus, which was Herod's early capital city. Nazareth is in the hills, 15 miles west of the Sea of Galilee and 20 miles east of the Mediterranean Sea. The town only had about two to 400 people and they were all working class. Maids or servants or artisans, carpenters, stonemasons that couldn't afford to live in the nicer towns that they worked in. It is such a tiny and insignificant place, and yet it takes on this prominent role in the salvation of the world. Mary is from Nazareth. And for 30 years, Jesus calls Nazareth his home. It was from the synagogue at Nazareth that Jesus announced that he was the fulfillment of prophecy. And it was also from Nazareth that Jesus launched his ministry. So why didn't God choose a better town? Why didn't he choose Capernaum or Bethlehem? or Bethany, or even Jerusalem. Why tiny Nazareth? I guess you might have to look 
at why Mary or why Joseph. It, it might appear random, but I think it is very intentional. God entrusted the Savior of the world to a girl named Mary and her husband Joseph. God entrusted the Savior of the world to a very small town in Galilee named Nazareth. What makes a community trustworthy? Probably very much the same thing that it takes to make a ministry trustworthy or a leader trustworthy. One, I would say transparency. If you are going to be a trustworthy leader, you have to come and put both your hands on the table and be transparent about who you are, what your intentions are, what your priorities are, and not have something snuck back in the back that you're going to reveal later. If you are going to be trustworthy as a leader or a town, you have to be willing to place justice as a priority. To be willing to see your community or people not through the eyes of your past prejudices, but see them as they are. See them as valued children of God. And not only see their value, but work to bring out that value and that potential. Third, you have to choose integrity over winning. And what that means is that in no situations do the means justify the end. We are living in a culture where it's doing dishonest things. We're seeing churches to do dishonest things in order to achieve a better outcome. But folks, that's a very lack of integrity. If you're going to keep your integrity, guess what? Sometimes you have to be willing to lose. Sometimes you have to be willing to be transparent, do everything right, and then have somebody else come and put something else on the table. Number four, you always have to pay attention to the least and the lost and the unnoticed. And finally, you have to love God, love your neighbor, and know the worth and value the worth of who God values. So having laid out these signs of integrity, let me ask you a really big question. Do you think God would have entrusted baby Jesus to us? Do you think God would have entrusted baby Jesus' care and protection and education and prayer life to us? We should ask ourselves that question with every infant we baptize, every confirmation class, and every time we see a rose on that altar. Because all of those represent that a family or a parent is entrusting a child to us. So I'm going to answer that question as best I can. And I would say yes. I believe in this community 
And in this church, God would entrust the Savior of the world to us. And let me tell you why. From 2004 to 2007, and you might have heard me tell these stories before, I served in the Southwest District. And what I knew then was that this church, Camden First United Methodist Church, was one of the cornerstone churches, not only in the Southwest District, but in Arkansas. The first time I attended or I walked in the doors of this church was 2005 for Ralph Hale's funeral service. Now, I'd only met Ralph Hale once. Um, and he did the funeral of one of my favorite people, Helene Mayfield. But I knew him by reputation. He was a giant among pastors in Arkansas. Talk about somebody with integrity. Talk about somebody with transparency. Talk about somebody who loved God and, and did the gospel. It was Ralph Hale. When I had churches that did O&P, they wanted to come to Camden because this church was considered the best place to do O&P. Back 20 years ago, back 20 years ago, when most churches were terrified because one of the largest employers in town had just announced they were shutting down and moving out, you voted to build that wonderful great hall. How many of you were here when they took that vote? Is that pretty scary? And you did it anyway. You said this was the right thing to do. And we're taking a big step and we're taking a big risk. And you paid for it. You did this gorgeous sanctuary, what, 10, 12 years ago? and restored it to its original beauty. Everybody who walks in here goes, wow, it's a real sanctuary. Many pastors have come out of this church. Mary Susan, Bud Reeves, Gary Harrison. There's a lot of local pastors that have come out of this church. But also, you used to have an associate, and you would take somebody young, and you would nurture them, and they've had great careers. And I go in that room, and I see Jim Polk, who's the bishop's assistant. And I see David Eaton, who's serving up in Indiana. And I see Pam Estes, who's up in Little Rock. Lots and lots of associate pastors that you have nurtured, you have prayed with and prayed for. You've helped teach them how to be pastors. But you know the number one reason, all these are great reasons? I've met your children and I've met your grandchildren. In some instances, I've made great-grandchildren that were raised by this church. You have taught them well. You have encouraged them. You have prayed for them. You have taught them who Jesus is, and you have taught them that it's important to serve God by serving your neighbor. Listen, I know it's easy to be discouraged 
after we have suffered through two and a half years of COVID and it's not over. And it's changed, although today it's really a nice crowd and I'm glad you're all here. And, and I know over the past two and a half years, not only have we suffered from COVID, but we have had some very significant deaths in our congregation. People that I look out there and I still see them are in the choir and I miss them every single week. But you want to hear some good news? God has not given up on this church. God has not given up on you. And God has not given up on our mission. You are doing more now in this community than you have ever done before. We are seeing real poverty showing up at our food pantry. In fact, they had to go get more food on Thursday because we had had 47 families and 43 families and what, 36 families, something like that, over the past week and had wiped us out of food. And because of you and because of your commitment we are able to continue to serve. We hit a record on Sue's table of 218 people that we fed out there. And folks, we're not just giving handicapped meals anymore. They're giving us prayer requests. I had one woman show up on Tuesday to come look for some books in our library. They may not be here yet on Sunday morning, but I expect them to show up at some point because you are doing ministry and you are displaying God's love with all the work you do. So I hope that you are encouraged because God hasn't given up on us yet. So don't you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, into our darkness, you have brought the light of your love. You have given to us a reminder of the many ways in which you care for us and guide us. This has been a hectic time for so many of us. We have invested ourselves, our energy, and our resources in a flurry of activity. And now we wonder how we're going to have the energy that this coming fall will demand. So help us place our trust and our lives in your care. As Joseph listened to the angel telling him to follow, help us follow you in all our ways. Give us strength and courage for the times ahead. Let love be the foundation from which all of our actions spring. Bless us and keep us in your care. For we ask this in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we enter into our offertory, and you're welcome to come to our offer, our altar and offer uh, prayers as needed.
glad to see you in worship today. Uh, we will continue our series in Matthew next week, and I hope to see you then. As you follow the star on your journey, don't look for the holy place in places of power and prestige. Instead, pay attention to the ordinary, the quiet places. There may you be overcome with joy and share your gifts with creation. Remember to get your Cooper bracelets on your way out. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.